I've got part two of the amazing interview with Ron Schneider coming up for you. I was so blessed to be able to interview Ron Schneider, uh, the original Dreamfinder walk-around character at Epcot, who's worked with Wally Bogue at the Golden Horseshoe at Disneyland. He's worked at Universal. He's worked at Magic Mountain. He's done a number of amazing things and had a fantastic interview with so much, so much I couldn't even fit it into one. So this is part two of the interview for you. Enjoy. Do you have any encounters that stand out as different, as exceptionally memorable? I know it's hard few. all of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, they, they uh, the story I tell all the time, and hi, gang, you've heard this before, but here it comes again. Um, I was walking off set one day. I was up in the Image Works, and I'm walking back to my dressing room and doing what I call the flying wedge. That is where you don't meet anybody's eyes because you'll get stopped and you'll never make it to the break room. <laughs> And I'm walking along and I break through this group of adults and there's this adorable little African-American child looking up at me and eyes as big as saucers. And I look around, there's no other kids around. And so I figure, okay, I'm safe. And I kneel down and I introduce myself and, uh, and talk to him and uh, he pets the dragon and like this. And, and, he's, and I get up, I stand up and I go, well, I gotta go now, goodbye. And he goes, goodbye, Jesus. Bye-bye, Jesus. <laughs> I, I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I was stuck. I was standing there. Everybody around me is laughing. The kid's crying. I go, I, I go, come on. Finally, I tore myself away. And I could just hear the guy when he gets back home. Yeah, I met him. He has two heads and he called me by my name. Um, it happened again. It happened again backstage at the Contemporary Resort Hotel. I was walking through the kitchen one time doing a special gig as Dreamfinder, and I walked by this fellow's cleaning an oven, and he looks at me and goes, you look just like Jesus. <laughs> um, so there's those. I met Michael Jackson, and I met mm -hmm. Mark Wilson, the magician, who was one of my heroes. I met Red Skelton and, um, uh, you know, the, the Give Kids the World kids yes. were, always, were always a thrill. And um, they, they were all magic moments to one extent or another, because not because they were magic for me, but because they were magic for them. And because that energy is what kept me going. Mm -hmm. You know, the Golden Horseshoe, you do, three, uh, do five shows a day for 310 people who are seated in air conditioning and have stood in line to see you and are there to see you. The Golden Horse, you know, working the, the as Dreamfinder, you're in 105 degree heat, and you're wearing a suit with the vest and the and the costume and the hat and the beard and and the dragon, and um, you're competing with all the other rides. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to get you have to mine the magic that's coming off the kid's face, and um, and that's you know that's that's what we do to learn to keep our, our spirits up to keep the the pixie dust to pack on because it flakes off very easily well and, and you mentioned the costume and um goodness because that outfit in particular what was it three layers plus the puppet mm -hmm. and all the face makeup mm -hmm. um how long were your sets typically? 30 minutes on 30 minutes off okay yeah um which you know in the florida heat uh goodness uh, I because I, working backstage with the photographer or with the characters, you would see them, you know, on stage. And I tell people that as soon as you hit that wall where you're off stage, you know, you're kind of walking, ah, ugh. <laughs> and people are going, it can't really be that bad. I'm like, oh, no, yes, it is. Uh, you know, the characters, they hit the break rooms and pieces of the costume go flying. And, <laughs> um, so it's one of those things, and especially, goodness, you said it took two years to get that costume to work right. If certain certain parts of it, for example, when they um, when they brought me on board, I said for the fake arm, they got an, mm -hmm. a fake arm that's holding the drag. Um, you measure me from the wrist to the elbow, from the elbow to the shoulder. You cut me two pieces of dowling. 
you put a uh, hook and eye socket uh, right over here. So this, so this bends naturally, and that's the fake arm. No, 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 no. They gave me a tube of cotton, a uh, muslin tube of cotton batting that was about six inches too long. Oof. So when I was holding the dragon, the, the arm would bow out uh, just above the wrist, <laughs> and it looked like my arm was broken in two places. So whenever I met people, I was always meeting them like this. Hi there, trying to keep this away from, away from them, away from the cameras. Um, it took them a long time to build me the arm that yeah. I told them up front. They did not have the, the uh, beards and mustaches made. So they were cut out of women's wigs. Mustaches were backed with cloth, um, not net, not net. So a net, you put it on and boom, it disappears. The cloth is about an eighth of an inch thick. And so you have to smile when you put it on, glue it on. If you stop smiling, it will pop off, which it did in, in two parades. I was down in Miami Beach. And I did a parade. I did the Three Kings Day parade through the um, Cuban section of uh, Miami. And about halfway through, I looked like Captain Ahab. Um, <laughs> oh. Uh, so, so things like that. Um, yeah, I, my dressing room, I didn't have a dressing room. When I first got to the pavilion, there was no place for me to break. I found a fire room up on the second yes. floor. Yeah, I, I remember you telling about that in the book. And yeah, fascinating to hear how much didn't function at the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, that's, that's, that's everything. Park is like that. Everything yeah. Park is like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's neat stories, but yeah, definitely want to plug if you want to know what it's like get the book <laughs> some great stories in it um let me see here so uh you've done all of these different characters at all of these different places um which one do you would you feel would be the hardest the most complicated for you to uh really kind of wrap your mind around and, and perform Each one presented its own challenges. Um, I always went, I always wound up doing things that were vastly different. Um, I went up to Canada in 98, 99 uh, to the Canadian Springs, uh, the Bath Springs Hotel up in the mm -hmm. Canadian Rockies and uh, played um, William Cornelius Van Horn, the man who built the, the Canadian Pacific Railroad mm -hmm. and uh, was the Teddy Roosevelt of Canada. So playing him, he was, a, he was a real person. And everybody in Canada knew who he was. Yeah. And um, I was playing him in the village that he built, in the hotel that he built. Um, so that was a whole different set of skills. And I'd never done a real historical character before. Then doing the Titanic experience, I wound up doing a one-hour tour mm -hmm. uh, in character as this Irish uh, dock worker. Um, I had to learn all over again about crowd control and uh, storytelling. Um, the guests came wanting to know about the Titanic disaster, but I had an hour tour, mm -hmm. most of which was not about the disaster, it was about the ship and the people on board and what a good time they were having. So I had to learn a whole different set of skills for that. Uh, doing the medicine pitch at mm -hmm. uh, Magic Mountain and again at, uh, at Disneyland. Um, uh, doing the uh, supervisor for the celebrity lookalikes at Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. So I had to, I already knew all about W.C. Fields and the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy, um, but I had to learn all about the Blues Brothers and I had to learn to write for them. I had to learn how to direct them and draw the characters out. And those are, and they're all very, very different kind of characters. Um, so it's each job that I've had a set its own set of, uh, of uh, challenges. And, but they were all, all in that same corporate theme park uh, form that, that I never lost track of, mm -hmm. that I always followed. They were, I was learning different aspects of the same thing. And um, that's what held my interest was, uh, oh, it's the same thing that I've already done but an entirely different way of doing it under entirely different circumstances. Sometimes I'd be on the street. Sometimes I'd be standing in a stadium. Um, sometimes I would be behind the scenes. 
Sometimes I'd have to do it in front of executives alone in a, in a meeting room. Mm -hmm. um, but it was all the same. It was all the same basic thing. Um, in, the, in the back of the book, I talk about the, um, the thing that all of these jobs had in common. Yes. And that which I had never thought about before until I was writing that chapter. And I talk about respect. Mm -hmm. Having respect for the source material, respect for the people you're working for, the people in, in the audience, and the respect for the um, for the form itself, mm -hmm. and uh, and I found that to be consistent throughout all these various things that I did. Uh, I find it was remarkably consistent, and so it, it was easy for me to became easy ultimately for me to step into all these different types of roles. Um, because the same principles apply. In fact, uh, one of my favorite chapters in your book is actually one of the appendixes. Mm -hmm. It's the five keys to great themed entertainment. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love that because there's so much that even when I was reading, it was like, gosh, I've been doing some of this my whole life and I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it, great stuff. Um, so I, I'm curious, have you, one of the things I, that, was really neat for me, uh, both at Disney and uh, on the train at Silver Dollar City, was when you would see kids come up dressed in your outfit as you. Um, and I actually had somebody say, yeah, well, what do you think about that when you see somebody come up dressed as you or as your character? When I was doing Dreamfinder, nobody, nobody ever came up to me when I was doing Dreamfinder dressed as Dreamfinder. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I, I can imagine what my response would be. People came up all the time dressed as Figment mm -hmm. and Figment would go nuts when he <laughs> saw that. I'll never forget the moment. The first time I saw a Figment hat, the, the, they just gotten him into the park. And the first guest who came up to me and was wearing a hat that was Figment's head. And um, uh, that was a remarkable. One of my favorite stories, I was, I was on vacation. Mm -hmm. from doing Dreamfinder. I was in California. I was on Hollywood Boulevard. I was walking across Hollywood Boulevard, waiting to, at an intersection. I was come up to this light and the light was red and I was waiting to cross. And I look up and the guy standing in front of me is wearing a figment hat <laughs> backwards. So it's looking at me. <laughs> uh, I said, what the hell are you doing here? I said it quietly. I didn't want to draw yeah. it. Um, I've seen a lot of people in the parks dressed as Dreamfinder. Um, I, 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 it never, it never happened when I was in character. So, mm -hmm. um, except, you know, except when I would see another Dreamfinder on the job, you know. But, right. But, um, uh, my line for everybody, whenever anybody would use the word imagination around me, I just say, thanks for the plug. <laughs> Do you ever catch yourself singing it? <laughs> there was a kid all by himself running through the image works one morning going imagination imagination that's about it um <laughs> no uh but then of course there was the night i was sitting at home wednesday night the phone rang i picked it up and the guy says uh you're on west park or south park you're on south park I said, what? You're on South Park. Turn it on now. I turned on <laughs> South Park and they had a one hour episode called Imagination Land, which is available on DVD. Hmm. And the guys from South Park had apparently seen Dreamfinder and Figment and they had a cartoon of the Dreamfinder going imagination, imagination, imagination. Wonderful. Wonderful. See, I've, I've never watched South Park, but I'll have to go look that up. Look it up. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's painfully funny. <laughs> and the whole episode, whole episode is about uh, in, what happens in Imagination Land. That, um, and uh, it's a wonderful episode. And I and I again, I got a lot of calls that night saying, oh, "You're just you're just on South Park." <laughs> um. So just curious, because all of these different things that you do, you're out performing. Do you consider yourself an extrovert? In theme park, you put me in a theme park, I am. Mm -hmm. um, 
And in, in general, I, I, I will work a crowd all the time. I always will work a crowd. If there's a bunch of people, I will be the loudest one. I will not, um, if, if it's, if it's something that I know will get a laugh, I'll play it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I just went around and give kids the world and I, they, they were into me a, a, a ECV, a little mm-hmm. electric wheelchair to get around in. Um, and whenever I roll up anywhere near somebody, I will always say, I got no brakes. <laughs> just, just, I know it's gonna get a laugh. I know mm-hmm. it's gonna get a laugh. Um, I, I'm, I'm always doing material, like I always do, I'm doing Dreamfinder material. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if I see a, a parent pushing a kid in a stroller, there's no one else around, I'll say to the kid, you're going to let him push you around like that? Or drag your feet, it drives him nuts. Yep. Um, so I'm always, I'm always doing that material. It, it depends on the situation. Um, so when you're not around a crowd or not a group to perform, though, because I'm what I call an extroverted introvert. If, if I've got the group to perform for, I'm on. Have, That's me. But then as soon as I'm done, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go hide in my corner now. <laughs> well, the, the, other thing, the other thing is this, that you and me, we both perform for a living. Mm-hmm. So you get off work, you shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I party for a living. I party on cue. Yeah. And so I would come backstage and I would collapse. I didn't go out much after work mm-hmm. because I party. Um, uh, Halloween didn't mean much to me. Because every day was yeah, Halloween right. for me. <laughs> um, and so when I had a job processing damaged luggage, mm-hmm. I partied after work. But um, when you party on cue, no, you need to save that energy. Okay. So I, and I find it interesting how many people that do perform in some way is are similar. That, okay, I'm done. I've had my fill of people. I've had my fill of social i'm going to just go close myself off for the rest of the night mm-hmm. so, yeah um, so it, it's always fun to hear that i'm not alone in that mm-hmm. <laughs> um it did have one other one here and uh grab my glasses that i dropped make sure i can read this here uh oh uh about your script writing because mm-hmm. you've also written a lot of scripts and a lot of people don't realize that they're actually hearing your material, mm-hmm. you know, even though it's not necessarily you. Because um, you you originally wrote the script for the train at Magic Kingdom, right? The Mickey's Birthday Land Express was the first pre-recorded narration on the Walt Disney World Railroad, yes. Okay. Um, what other scripts have you written that we may have heard and not known? Um, I wrote the shows for, um, well, the, the first couple of years at Universal Studios, I wrote everything for the lookalikes. Okay. Uh, that they didn't, the stuff that they didn't improvise. Uh, then when it came time for the first uh, Halloween at Universal, I wrote uh, shows for that. I wrote the uh, Bates Motel show with the Blues Brothers, mm-hmm. and I wrote uh, Chainsaw Massacre, Nazareth's Chainsaw Massacre um, for the first Halloween show. Uh, the for Halloween event. Um, for uh, Disney, I uh, had a hand in writing um, the pre-show for the Doug uh, live show mm-hmm. at the Disney MGM and uh, various other video productions. Um, I wrote uh, the, uh, the uh, I, I, I had a hand in various, various shows. Didn't write a lot. Um, I never uh, really considered myself to be a writer more than as much as I considered myself someone who knew how to write this particular type of stuff okay. for theme parks. Um, I never studied writing. I, when I was in college, we had a, I had a class in makeup, theatrical makeup. Mm-hmm. And I went in one day and our teacher, uh, Robert Ryan, I think was his name. He said, um, today we're going to uh, learn to draw ourselves. We're gonna make a portrait, a self portrait. And everybody in the class went, uh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he said, they gave us a piece of paper and a pencil. He said, sit down in front of a mirror. And what you do is you look in the mirror and you make a line in the paper. And if the line looks like you, you keep it. And if it doesn't, you erase it. <laughs> it's like Which that sounded, old story about sculpting a statue. Chiseling away what part uh, doesn't look like an elephant. Right. So uh, at the end of 60 minutes, 
I had captured my eyes. It was eerie. It was very mm -hmm. eerie. And that's how I write for theme parks. I put down a line and uh, if it works, I keep it. If it doesn't, I take it out. I keep going back and rereading and rereading and rereading aloud mm -hmm. uh, to see how it's going to read. Um, and um, my rule on writing a joke, as you, as you read in the book, is if I don't laugh at it myself, um, I know no one else is going to laugh at it. Right. Uh, the moment I was writing the, Blue, the Bates Motel show, which, is, which you can find on, online on YouTube also. And um, the, the, had a, the moment when the Blues Brothers were singing and the, uh, these two gorgeous babes were, were dancing back up with them. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, and I had Mother Bates come out of the, the, the motel and dance with the girls doing backup. Mm -hmm. When I thought of that, I died laughing. <laughs> but I knew that was going to be a big moment in the show, as it was. The audience loved it. Um, and that's when I, that was the moment that I realized I have to laugh at it myself or no one else is going to laugh at it. Um, so that is kind of what governed me in writing this stuff. I wrote, I was just looking at some stall material I wrote for Kong. Mm -hmm. um, there was somebody posted online uh, for when you went through the confrontation and the ride would break down, they would take you through and they would do stall material. So mm -hmm. I wrote the stall material for that. But it was it was a matter of not that I was a writer, but I knew theme parks and I knew audiences. And so I would sculpt something for it that would not uh, insult their intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a lot of it is uh, you learn, don't treat treat the guests like an idiot even if they are at times because oh yeah <laughs> uh you know because you know, we joke that the ever-present question at disney is what time is the three o'clock parade you and, know why do you know why that's an intelligent question oh go ahead do you know why what i'll tell you why because the three o'clock parade is only three o'clock when it starts by the time it gets to Main Street, it's not three o'clock anymore. That's and, what they mean by what time is a three o'clock parade. Well, and we were trained, don't answer it at three o'clock, even right. though um, a lot of the guests do think that's the name of the parade. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you answer it in such a way that the guest doesn't, that even if they realize it's a dumb question, mm -hmm. you make it sound like it's an intelligent question. Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, we're here at the Castle Hub. It'll be here at 315. You know, or you're up exactly. at Main Street. And so you learn to answer the questions in such a way that the guest doesn't feel dumb, but at the same time you're going. <laughs> People would come up to me in imagination uh, just after we opened and say, where's number seven? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, what's, what is number seven? And they get their map out and they'd show me and on the map, the pavilions were numbered and imagination was number six, and number seven was American Adventure, which was at the other end of the, park. End of the park. And I would say to them, "You don't want to go to number seven. <laughs> go, go to the, this number and start over and work around to number seven. Um, but they wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't yeah. listen to me. This um, woman came up to me. Um, I, I'm working at the Kodak Pavilion, right? And this woman came up to one woman. God bless her. She had she had a um, Instamatic camera, one of those box Instamatics, mm -hmm. where you would drop the film in. And with an instamatic film camera, you would push the button to take the picture, and then you'd wind the film mm -hmm. with this thing over here. So this woman gets the camera, she puts it up in front of me, and she wound the film. And then she put it down, and she snapped the picture. I said, ma'am, ma'am, no, no, that's that this, this winds the film, this takes the picture. She said, don't tell me, it's my camera. I said, yes, ma'am, yes, yes. But this is the Kodak Pavilion. I work for Kodak. This is, she goes, she says, I know what I'm doing. Yep. I said, I said, ma'am, do me a favor. When you get home, would you send me some of your vacation pictures? <laughs> because I'd love to see them. Because she has this wonderful collection of pictures of carpeting. Yep. Uh, and of course, as a photographer, we'd have people all the time, hand us the camera, you push the button. I'm happy you told me. I wouldn't have known. <laughs> Never would have guessed. And then, of course, after doing this for 40 years, I figure that I've spent probably two years of my life waiting for people to take the damn picture. <laughs> and that was one thing 
my characters that I worked with always appreciated the fact that I was fast. I'm like, look there, snap here, boom, boom, we're done. Get <laughs> yeah. It's like, look, don't waste time going, okay, everybody, one, two, oh, just snap it at one. Let's get done. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm curious, because uh, like I said, we got questions all the time. Uh, you know, you stand in front of the restroom. Where's the restrooms? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a wonderful, wonderful story about um, this man who was working, had been working at uh, Big Thunder Mountain at mm -hmm. Disneyland, um, which, of course, at Disneyland is located in the middle of Frontierland. Right. Um, not off to the side. Not off the end. And, um, and uh, there's a fellow, it was, his, it was his last night working Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and they had put him on point. So he was standing right out in front underneath the big sign that said Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And uh, this family came, comes walking up to him and said, excuse me, how do we get to Big Thunder Railroad? It was his last night. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll tell you what you do. He says, you see the entrance to the fort over there? He goes, yeah. He says, go out the front of the fort, go out of Frontierland, go out to Main Street, okay? Turn left. On your left, you'll see Sleeping Beauty Castle, okay? Go through Sleeping Beauty Castle, go to the back of Fantasy Lane, turn left. Take that around to your left. You're going to find Big Thunder Trail. You take that around, keep going, keep going, and eventually you'll see the entrance on your left. They said, okay, and they walk off, and about 10 minutes later, they come around the other way. They see the same guy, and they say, thank you, and they walked on to Big walk Thunder. <laughs> True story. I was working at Magic Kingdom uh, near the right around the Castle Hub area. It had this uh, gentleman walk up to me, very aggravated. How do you get to the haunted mansion? Okay, well, you see the bridge right over there that takes you right. It's not over there. And I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's right there. You can almost see. I just came from there. It's not there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you walk across, not why are you telling me it's there when it's not there? I've already been over there. Okay, I am so sorry, sir. It what finally helped him out. Okay, let me tell you how to get there. Do you see the Tomorrowland entrance over here? Just walk under the arch. When you get all the way through Tomorrowland, you'll see the Indy Speedway. Make the left turn there. Go all the way around. I directed him all the way around the park. Thank you very much. It's about time somebody told me how to get there. Have a nice tour of the park. <laughs> Just, uh, the one that probably stands out for me, and, and you'll enjoy this. I was working at Hollywood Studios one afternoon and this older lady walks up to me and says, how can I get on the monorail from here over to Animal Kingdom? <laughs> okay. Now, if you've been there, you know, there's no monorail at Hollywood Studios. There's no monorail at Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, man, there isn't one here. There's a bus that runs. You, I don't want the bus. I want the monorail. I want the monorail that goes from here. Well, there, and repeatedly oh man there isn't a monorail i can get you on a bus i can i don't want those and 10 minutes of trying to convince this poor lady and she finally looks at me and says i don't know what you're so full of but i rode the monorail into the park this morning well ma'am i'm sorry they must have torn it down then after you got off because there isn't a monorail there now <laughs> The, the ultimate story of that is the, about the couple that drove down from New York to see the opening of Walt Disney World mm -hmm. and got down here and they paid their money to park and they got on the monorail and they rode the monorail around and thought they'd seen it. <laughs> and got off the monorail and went back to New York. We, I, I remember at Epcot, uh, the camera shop was right underneath Spaceship Earth. Mm -hmm. and we were in there morning nobody comes in the camera shop in the morning mm -hmm. and so we're just standing at the doorway watching and we watch this one man go around spaceship earth probably four or five times you know watch him get in line write it come back around walk around again and finally one of uh the merchandise people said sir can we help you he's like is this all the park there is <laughs> <laughs> no just walk straight next 
turn your head, damn it. People, people, you got to keep your head on a swivel. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we had a good time laughing at the guests afterwards, but yeah. of course, you do that with. <laughs> but, uh, you feel you feel bad for them, but at the same time, you, 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 you know, you work there long enough and and you, you, it, they, it, it, it's easy to think of them as meat. Yes, it happens. It just happens. And um, our greatest skill, the thing that makes it possible for us to survive and even thrive in that atmosphere is the ability to look past that instinct and recognize them as people like ourselves. It's a little bit easier if you're a fan yourself. Yes. And um, of course, don't let Disney know that you're a fan. So you can't (laughs) you can't come into the park. You people listening who want the jobs. Don't come into the park and tell them that you want a job because you love Disney. Disney. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You, want, you want to come in there and be kind of blase about it. I learned that from Dave Smith. We don't hire, we don't hire Disney fans at the, at the archives. I love people. I love performing, but if you're like, oh, Disney, yeah, it, it'll give you, <laughs> it'll give you an interesting perspective. So again, I want to make sure I plug the book uh, from dreamer to dream finder. So many great stories in here. Uh, honestly, one of my favorite books I've read about the parks. So um, thank you so much for spending time with me. Uh, it has been fun. I hope you've enjoyed it. Very uh, much. Very much, sir. It was wonderful. And uh, look forward. Oh. Uh, also, you have a series. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a series on YouTube yes. called Ron Schneider's Wild Rides. Amazing. Where I interview other people uh, like... Uh, my host and myself who uh, have been fans and have made a career out of doing this. And yeah, uh, yeah. the stories are fascinating. Also, uh, I've got a, a movie on YouTube called the further mm-hmm. adventures of Walt's frozen head. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, that you need to, to look up. It's all, the whole thing's on YouTube and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of a, like a Frank Capra movie uh, in which I get to play Walt Disney's frozen head. Um, and, um, and also I just want to invite everybody to come find me on Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. I love meeting people and, and talking about this stuff. And uh, and thank you, sir, for uh, for inviting me. Well, and, and thank you. It has been fun. Like I said, it, it's something I've wanted to do for years. I'm like, I finally get to do it. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. My and pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, trust me, it was fantastic. And there's so much more. I really do hope to be able to have him back again because we barely scratched the surface on a lot of things. Uh, Don't forget, if you have not ordered his book to do so, it is an amazing book. I will put links in the description for you so you can order that. Uh, They will be affiliate links, just be aware. But uh, one of the best books I have read out there in all seriousness. So check out his book. Check out his channel as well with Ron's Wild Rides. Some amazing interviews there. Uh, Just a ton of fun. You won't be sorry. Thank you so much for liking the video, for sharing and subscribing as well. Thank you to my financial partners uh, for helping to make things like this possible. I am so blessed by their support. If you want to know more, check the description below. Thank you so incredibly much for watching. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to know about contact information, fan pages, merchandise, and more, please be sure to check the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to know when I have new ones, well, make sure you hit that subscribe button right up there. And if you want to see another one of my videos, well, I've got a great one for you right here. And a huge thank you to these wonderful people here who support me on Patreon and with YouTube memberships. They get behind the scenes information, special perks, and more. If you'd like to know more about that, Well, make sure you check that button right there. Thank you so much.